our program tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen. I was born and raised in a polygamy group. We are broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah, and this is a telephone call-in program. Uh, our telephone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. If you would rather communicate with us by email, our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com. And either way, whether it's by telephone or email, we'd like to hear from you regarding your comments and your questions about polygamy. All of our previous programs can be viewed on the internet in streaming video on www.whatloveisthis.tv. So you might tell any uh, folks that you know of who are unable to receive the program on their television sets that they can go to that website, whatloveisthis.tv, and watch all of our previous programs. If you or someone that you know is in a polygamy group and you're in need of help, you can go to our website, shieldandrefuge.org, shieldandrefuge.org, and you can find information on how to get help and information. If you or someone that you know in a polygamy group is being abused or being forced into something that you don't want to do. You can find information on that website to help you. You can also please call 911 if it's an emergency and our toll free number 877-425-9993. Uh, we are available for help if you need help at any time so please feel free to call that as well. If you're in a polygamy group and you feel like that it would be helpful uh, to join a discussion group, or even if you've left a polygamy group and you feel like that a discussion group would be helpful f f for you, you're welcome to come to our discussion groups we have in the Salt Lake City area once a month on the third Monday of each month at 6.30. And if you would like to come, please just give us an email or a phone call and we'll be happy to give you the details. Our next discussion group is going to be on May 18th. And remember that we will give a free DVD to anyone who is in a polygamy group or has been in one. Um, call, the DVD is entitled Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. All you need to do is give us a call or an email and let us know how we can get this DVD to you. It's uh, no strings attached. We just want to give it to you. We think it will be helpful to you. We do hope that you enjoyed our program last week, our pre-recorded program on the LeBaron polygamy group and early Mormon polygamy and polygamists and the blood atonement that they practiced. Um, normally we would take questions tonight regarding last week's show, however, since we have a different agenda tonight and we do have guests, we would like you to remember what your questions and comments are and please send them to us by email or wait until next week. Next week I'm not going to have a guest and we're going to cover some of our past emails and questions. So if you have any comments about last week's show, please remember watch next week and you can call in what your concerns are about that program. I do have one email I'd like to read this week, however, because I believe that it fits very well into our subject matter for tonight. It was an email that I received on April 17th from Mr. H, and this is what he said. He said, Hi, Doris. Remember the worst day you had when you were in a polygamy group. Think of the best show that you've made to date, and look at the big gulf between those two times in your life. You are helping the silent who can't talk yet. So don't stop and bring them all the way. I married a woman from a polygamy family several years ago. Her father had five wives and 30 kids. Most of these kids are drunks, drug addicts, in prison or dead. And most who are dead took their own lives. I am now divorced. You may use this on your show, but please don't read my name on the air. God bless you big time. Mr. H. This is why one of the reasons that we produce this program. Countless lives and families through the ages or through the years, through the decades, have been ruined and, and, and had been in misery because of polygamy. And only God knows how many souls have been lost because of a false salvation plan that requires polygamy. And then there are young girls whom we're going to talk about tonight, some of them, who have been threatened with damnation if they don't practice celestial marriage, and then when they capitulate and do practice it, 
they live a life of hell. Thank you, Mr. H. We appreciate your email. We had several positive comments about our show on the 16th when we interviewed Emily and Eliza Partridge, two sisters whom Joseph Smith took into polygamous celestial marriage. Tonight we're going to interview two more of the plural wives and again it's going to be done by proxy and they're going to be teenage girls that Joseph Smith married. Please remember that this is a dramatization only and that all of the interview questions and answers are taken from the historical accounts found in the book entitled In Sacred Loneliness which it was written by Todd Compton. Now, you can research all this information yourself. You can read this book, you can find other information on the internet, and you can find out uh, what we're talking about tonight in these interviews. The book, In Sacred Loneliness, is available at the website utlm.org. You can also find other historical information. We have been accused of uh, lies, telling lies in these interviews. And I want you to know, if you do not check this out for yourself, it may be you who end up believing lies. Tonight we are going to interview, um, by proxy, Lucy Walker, who is portrayed by Elizabeth Linton. Thank you, Elizabeth, for coming and sharing your time again. Okay. And we're going to interview, by proxy, Helen Mar Kimball, who is portrayed by Felicia Carr. Thank you. And we want to thank you for sharing your time with us as well. Mm -hmm. We're going to interview Lucy Walker first, and so I'm going to introduce her to you before I begin answer, asking the questions. Lucy Walker was born on April 30th of 1826. When Lucy was six years old, her father made a decision that drastically changed and ultimately changed her family's uh, situation forever. He was baptized a Mormon. Two years later, the family moved from Vermont to New York, and then the following year, Lucy was baptized into the Mormon church herself. In 1838, the family had nine children and seven wagons in a wagon train, and they moved to Missouri. However, there was a lot of unrest and persecution taking place, and so they moved on to Illinois. Joseph Smith and the Walker family seemed to be very closely acquainted. And so, Lucy, <clears throat> um, let's discover what led you into a polygamist relationship with Joseph Smith. First of all, would you tell us about your first meeting with Joseph Smith? Well, my brother had come home with an invitation to dinner at the Smith home, and that was our first encounter with Emma and the children and the prophet. And how old were you at the time? Fifteen, sixteen. 15. Okay. And that summer your family experienced quite a tragedy. Would you tell us about that? Well, my mom took on malaria, and she had ended up passing away. And that was very traumatizing. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Uh, had your mother accepted Mormonism? She did. At first, she was very hesitant, um, but she came around to the idea and then became very, became very religious mm -hmm. in the matter. Okay. Now, when your mother died, Joseph Smith interview, intervened in your family's affairs. Would you please explain what he did? Well, he came to our house, and at the time, my dad was devastated, and so he told my father that he needed a change of scenery, and he told him that he would take care of the oldest of us, the four of us, and the younger children could go with some friends of the family, and, and my dad ended up going on a mission, so I was a maid in um, helping Emma with things for boarding and for school. So he took you into his home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, you were 16 years old, mm -hmm. and Joseph Smith then approached you with a very unusual message. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about what that was all about? Well, he came to me and said that he had a, um, a command from the Lord that he needed to take another wife, and I was that woman. You were that woman, 16 years old. And you were mm -hmm. that woman. Now, <clears throat> his proposal was phrased as if it were a direct command from God. 
for him to do that. And how did that make you feel? That surely made it, would have given you kind of a strange reaction. I was shocked. Yeah? I was scared. Um, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was living there, and he came to me with this idea, I guess, mm -hmm. at the time. How did he explain celestial marriage to you? And did he use his spiritual uh, authority to bear on whether or not you should be listening to this kind of conversation? Yes, actually, he <clears throat> told me that, um, he asked me, actually, do you believe that I am a prophet of God? And I said, yes, I do. And so that was like a way that kind of triggered something in my mind. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he explained celestial marriage to you. Did it make sense? Did it, did it compute, so to speak? Uh, not really, because I didn't, I didn't quite get it, you know, me. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't have anyone to really kind of bounce it off of. You know, my mom had yeah. passed away. My dad was away. He was and gone. Mm -hmm. um, Smith uh, coerced his prospective plural wives by placing the burden of their own and their family's salvation on their shoulders um, and had that bound up in their answer of whether or not they would accept polygamy. Did he do that with you? He did. He said that it was a blessing for my family to accept it and otherwise it would bring damnation. And I didn't, my, like I said, my father was away on a mission so I had no one to just plead with, you know, to just find out what a, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, and you were under the protection of his home and his roof mm -hmm. and and his so-called um, authority. Authority, yeah. Um, so, did you resist his proposal? I did, and I told him it was just awkward, and so yeah. he told me to pray about it, and so I took a lot of time just praying and just asking God. It, uh, I can't even describe the pain and the torture that I went through at that time. I just wanted to die. I was suicidal. My goodness. De depressed. And um, I just didn't want to live anymore. And I received no answer to this plead with God. And, and so in, in your prayers you received no answer. And in your mind and your emotions you were looking at a, a, a black, bleak future being married to... You know, when you're 16, you have, mm -hmm. most girls will have these dreams and and yeah. um, and hopes for the future, but that kind of squashed it, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Several months later, in the spring of 1843, you still had not given Joseph Smith your answer, and so he approached you again. Now, it seems like Joseph Smith would not take no for an answer. <laughs> Tell did. us what happened. Well, he approached me again, and he said I had... Um, to give him an answer by the next day. And he said it wasn't um, an opportunity for me to agree or decline based on romance. And I didn't have feelings for him at all. And so he said if I rejected the command of God, it would bring damnation. And so that was held over my head. And having 24 hours, mm -hmm. um, I just told him, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, so he gave you the time limit and threatened you if you rejected his proposal. Mm -hmm. And you're only 16 years old. Okay, so you were infuriated. How did, how did, you, how did you deal uh, with him? I was so angry because I felt like um, I was being sacrificed on an altar pretty much. Uh -huh. um, and it was just, it was very discouraging. I had friends, ambitions, and I thought a future. Um, but by the morrow, I just, I just told him that unless I received word from God, I would not um, accept his proposal. Wow. So you had the courage to stand up to him mm -hmm. about that. That's, that's very brave yeah. of you to be able to do that. What did he do then when you told him that? Well, he walked away and then turned to me with a smile of confidence and just said, you will receive a blessing from God um, and a testimony in regards to celestial marriage. And so that was a little, 
Because I had been praying all this time and nothing. And nothing, uh-huh. So, so did you receive a manifestation? Actually, that night, um, a heavenly presence filled my room, and it just gave me such a peace that just I didn't ever feel before. So I just knew that was what he was talking about. Goodness sakes. And so, so you capitulated and you became another plural wife to Joseph Smith based upon that manifestation you had yeah. that night. And you were sealed to Joseph Smith. The day after my birthday, actually, May 1st, um, I was sealed to Joseph and um, another sister wife, Eliza Partridge, she was a witness. So you were 17 years old, just barely 17. Mm -hmm. And he, how old was he? 36, I think? Mm -hmm. 36 years old. Uh, double, more than double your age. And so there was no romance. Uh, you were not in love with him. There was no romance in your union with him at all. It was just out of duty to just obey the command that I was given of God. Um, at 18 years old, you became a very young widow. What happened? Well, Joseph was killed in, um, in the Carthage jail. And after that, I moved on because I wanted to be a school teacher and I wanted to get some education. And so I moved away for mm -hmm. a little while mm -hmm. to do yeah. that. Good. But <laughs> you weren't a single widow for very long, were you? No. <laughs> what happened? Um, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball began marrying the wives of Joseph. And so I married Heber C. Kimball and became one of his better oh, wives. His plural wives. So you were married to Heber C. Kimball then at that time for time, but you were still married to Joseph mm -hmm. Smith for eternity. Right. When Heber C. Kimball was dying, he made a very strange request of you, something that is totally outside of the biblical realm of authority. What was mm -hmm. that? Well, he pulled us aside, and um, I had some private time with him before his death, and he just told me that I was one of, I was a very good mother and wife, one of the best, and he just pleaded with me that um, I would um, just, Come, just come before Joseph and plead on his behalf. Intercede on behalf mm -hmm. for of him. Mm -hmm. Just to tell Joseph that he was a good father, a good Joseph husband. And okay, that's all very interesting. And that, of course, is another example of the unbiblical activity and authority that the early Mormons and polygamists did. Uh, because had he, and even had Lucy, been in the Bible and knew what the Bible said, they would know that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Jesus Christ. It isn't Lucy Walker. And also that God is the judge. It isn't Joseph Smith. And so um, Lucy Walker Smith Kimball pioneered to Utah with the rest of the Mormons when Brigham Young took him west, and she died at the age of 84 years of age on October 1st, of 1910. She had lived a, a sad and lonely life as a polygamous wife of Heber C. Kimball. Um, thank you for <laughs> the time for this. We're going You're to interview welcome. Helen next. Uh, right now, however, I'd like to open up the telephone lines. Uh, we still will be interviewing Helen Mark Kimball, but I thought we could open up the phone lines now. So if you have any questions or comments, you can begin calling in and the operators will have an opportunity to screen the calls and, um, and get, kind of get a jump on the phone calls as uh, we go on with the show. The telephone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Okay, Helen. Yes. <laughs> I would like to introduce uh, Helen Mar Kimball. Mm -hmm. uh, she was born August 22nd of 1828. She was third in a family of nine children. She is the daughter of Heber C. and Valate Kimball. And Heber C. Kimball, probably most of you are familiar with that name, he became a very prominent member of the early Mormon church. When Helen was only three years old, her parents were baptized into the Mormon church. And in the fall of 1833, they moved from New York to Kirtland, Ohio. In February of 1835, Heber C. Kimball was called to be an apostle 
and within 10 years he was the second most prominent man uh, in, the, in the Mormon church. This family had become a general authority family and was now part of the elite among the Mormons. On September 18th of 1839, Heber C. Kimball was called on a mission to England. And Helen, let's talk about this a little bit. When he was in England, of course you were just a young girl, mm -hmm. and when your father was in England, he would often send home to you toys, mm -hmm. uh, and which was a very generous, thought, thoughtful father thing mm -hmm. to do. And one time he sent home two China dolls mm -hmm. to you, and you displayed them in your home, mm -hmm. and uh, you had a visit, uh, Joseph Smith came to visit the home at one point. Tell us what happened. He picked up one of my china dolls, and when he did, he was holding it, and he broke the head off, and then didn't say, I'm sorry, didn't apologize, and didn't offer to repair it, just kind of made some offhand remark and gave it back to me, and then later I repaired it. I still had it in 1881. Yeah, and, and that was the end of it. Now, mm -hmm. this kind of an odd thing to, to maybe bring up in this interview, but I really think that when we see that, Joseph Smith didn't have... Um, uh, uh, the consideration for a person's mm -hmm. feelings mm -hmm. or another person's property, obviously, mm -hmm. and certainly a child, certainly a child's property, yeah. which I think gives us a lot of uh, insight into his character, right? Right very early yeah. on there, yeah. especially with you. Uh, and you didn't forget that, so as we no. go on. On March 22nd of 1842, mm -hmm. you are 13 years old and you attend a birthday party. Tell us about that party. It was a party for my friend Sarah Ann Whitney, and it was her 17th birthday. And so I went there, and I met her older brother. His name was Horace. And I saw him, noticed him, but there wasn't a romance or anything yet. I was still really young, but I noticed but him. But he impressed you. Oh, he, very much. He was yes. very much, yeah. And I yes. think you must have impressed him as well. <laughs> Your father then returns home from his mission mm -hmm. about that time, um, and then Joseph Smith made a shocking demand of your father. What was that? Joseph came to my father and told him that God had revealed to him that he needed my mother as Joseph's plural wife. And so after my father agonized over this demand, uh, he finally presented my mother to Joseph in the temple, and it was a matter of choosing between Mormonism and his wife, choosing between Joseph and his wife. And he chose? He chose Joseph. He chose Joseph Smith over mm -hmm. his wife, yes. your mother. And um, we, we find from historical records that Joseph Smith revealed at that time that he really didn't want your mother for a mm -hmm. wife. He was just testing the devotion of Heber yeah. C. Kimball. I find that very cruel. Um, I, I'm sure your mother felt the same way. In fact, I know yes. she did from some of the things I've read. Now, lo not long after that, your father, Heber C. Kimball, uh, entered into his first plural marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, reportedly, Joseph Smith threatened him with damnation if he didn't comply mm -hmm. with the um, order of plural marriage. And it ended up that Heber C. Kimball complied very well because in the end he had 45 wives and this mm -hmm. was one of them. And this same man, this is the same man that I've spoken of before on this show mm -hmm. uh, who said, uh, or had made the remark that he thought no more of taking another wife than he did of buying a cow. This is the same man here. Mm -hmm. uh, now in the early summer of 1843, your father approached you, your own father now mm -hmm. approached you you are 13 years old, yeah. and he approaches you with a very strange request. Would you explain that to our viewers? Without any plan preliminaries or introductions, my father told me, he asked me, would you believe me if I told you that it's commanded by God for a man to take more than one wife? And at first I was really angry, and I said, no, I can't believe that you would tell me this, and I couldn't understand why my father would bring up something that seems so unworthy and so beneath him. But then he taught me the principles of plural and celestial marriage and that it was God restoring the principles of the Old Testament. And 
So I listened and I didn't believe. I was in disbelief and complete dismay. It bothered me. But there was so much shock. It was like a small earthquake. And then he came in and he introduced my friend Sarah Ann to me, the one whose birthday party I'd gone to, and introduced her as Joseph's wife. And that must have really shocked you to find out that your friend mm -hmm. was now a plural wife of Joseph Smith. Oh, very much. And so how did your father end this conversation? He asked me to become a wife of Joseph, who was then 36. Goodness sakes. <laughs> uh, strangely enough, before mentioning this to his 14-year-old daughter, uh, Helen Mar Kimball, Heber C. Kimball had already offered up Helen Marr to Joseph Smith mm -hmm. as a plural wife. Of course, she didn't know this, and mm -hmm. again, she's only 14 years old. During the next 24 hours, what was the emotional state of your mind? It was complete disbelief. I didn't know what to think or how to feel. I didn't know what was going on. It was a matter of trying to understand what my father was doing, what Joseph was doing. And eventually it came to a point where I had to kind of make up my mind. And uh, Joseph Smith had pressured Lucy Walker with the mm -hmm. time limit to decide, did he use that same tactic on you? Yeah, it was 24 hours. You had 24 hours to yes. decide. That's abuse. <laughs> what happened mm -hmm. after 24 hours? Well, it was actually before the 24 hours were over. Uh, the next morning, Joseph came to the house and he explained plural marriage to me as my father had done. And he told me that if I took this step that I would ensure the salvation for my entire family. Oh, okay. So he did the same thing that he did with others, including Lucy. Mm -hmm. So he placed the responsibility on your shoulders, a 14-year-old girl, mm -hmm. of your family and also yourself, again, whether or not you became his plural wife. Yes, ma'am. Were you attracted to him? No, not at all. What it was my responsibility to be his wife, but not to like a him responsible thing to, be to attractive. do. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what did your mother think about all this? She was against it. I mean, I was a little girl, but she didn't dare say anything or express it. And so she told me that if it was something I agreed to, then she had nothing to say. She couldn't say anything more. No. She couldn't say anything against it. That would have been her downfall. Mm -hmm. And so you were uh, married to Joseph Smith, fulfilling your duty. Mm -hmm. In May of 1843, I wasn't quite 15 years old yet. I was still three months shy. You were still 14. For time and eternity. Okay. Were you a happy and content plural wife? No, not at all. Okay. I didn't ever get to participate in anything. I missed my teen years. My friends went to parties and I had to miss them. I had nothing to do with anything. And Joseph Smith wouldn't let you go out, would he? No. He, he kept a keen eye on you. Mm -hmm. My brother Horace went, to, or my brother William went to a party and our other friends were there and I wasn't allowed to go. And these marriages, by the way, were kept secret. They, they were not publicly known that Joseph Smith was married to you, too. Uh, so anyway, did you believe, did you, or did, as you grew older, did you continue to believe that your salvation truly had depended upon your marriage to Joseph Smith? No. And if I had known after I got married what I knew before, or if I had known before what I knew after, I wouldn't have married him. I would have said no because... The whole family salvation was not dependent on him. He had nothing to do with it. Okay. So your circumstances, again, changed drastically when mm -hmm. you became a widow in June of 1844. Mm -hmm. And now you're a widow at 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and as he did to several of Joseph Smith's widows, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball uh, came in for the <laughs> for the kill, as it will, were. Mm. And he, Brigham Young approached you with a marriage proposal, but you were also very brave, and you refused to be sealed to Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. But you, that left you free to do what? I married Horace. <laughs> 
<laughs> you fulfilled your romantic interest yes, in Taurus. Yes, <laughs> finally. It was February 3rd, 1846, and we yeah. finally got married. But it was only for time. It couldn't be for eternity because I had Joseph. Joseph Smith had that. Okay. Uh, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball, as we've already mentioned, began taking the plural wives of uh, Joseph Smith, the plural widows, I should say, of Joseph Smith. And by February of 1846, Heber C. Kimball had married 25 women. This was less than two years after Joseph Smith was killed. Helen Marr Kimball Smith Whitney and mm -hmm. her husband, Horace Whitney, moved west to Utah with the Mormons mm -hmm. when they went west. However, Horace did become a polygamist himself. Mm -hmm. And to, much to his credit, however, he tried to be a kind and a fair polygamist husband to mm -hmm. his polygamist wives. Helen lived a long life. Mm -hmm. Often it was in bad health, and it was in deep sadness and pain and loneliness uh, known only to the women who practiced polygamy. She lost several of her children uh, when they were very young. She lost them to death, and um, in, she herself died November 15th of 1896. Uh, thank you for giving us this information about Helen Kimball. We are taking phone calls. If you would like to call in, 801-973-TV20. Uh, this information that we have brought to you tonight is from the book In Sacred Loneliness. It is not lies as we have been accused. All the information is there. It's been taken out of diaries and historical accounts. And you can read that information in the book In Sacred Loneliness. And there are other avenues to find this information as well. It seemed as though Joseph Smith, when he wanted to take a teenage girl as a plural wife, he seemed to follow a particular pattern. First of all, he would uh, propose to the teenager while she was living or in his home or at least under his care. And then he would approach her and explain the principle of plural celestial marriage to her. And normally she uh, initially would resist. And then he would pressure her with a time limit to make her decision and give her the burden of the salvation of her family and of herself being wrapped up in her decision. And then he tells her that she will have a spiritual experience confirming the properness of his proposal. And oddly enough, she would have that spiritual experience. And so she would then capitulate and become yet another plural wife of Joseph Smith. Um, I would like to ask you, as we're waiting for these calls to come in. It looks like we have some calls, but they haven't quite come ready for us yet. So, um, F Felicia and Elizabeth, as you did a lot of preparation for this, you read a lot of historical accounts of these women, and, and more than what we even talked about tonight, because we don't have time to talk about everything that you learned. But as you prepared for the show, and you read the historical record of Helen Mark Kimball and of Lucy Walker, much in their history was loneliness and sad, sadness. And um, you also ran across deceit and um, coercion in these plural marriages. Would you share with our viewers your own personal response and feelings as you were reading these historical accounts? I was angry, um, very, very sad for these women um, to be turned away like cattle or given away or sold, however you put it. Um, words can't really describe it, made me want to just throw up. Um, it's very sad to know that this is um, how a prophet treated women. Um, he didn't care about feelings, emotions, and just the own personal desires that women that women feel, you know? Mm -hmm. The sense of being needed to be loved and yeah. cherished. Yeah. That didn't exist um, mm. with the characters that I had researched. Mm. And Continue. it's just definitely not of God. And right. it's heartbreaking, mm -hmm. you know, to know that women live their whole entire lives mm -hmm. without the opportunity to be loved. Mm -hmm. And... And the yearning for it and knowing mm -hmm. the hopelessness mm -hmm. of knowing that yeah. they'll never get it. 
Felicia, yeah. would you share with us your deep feelings? It's very painful to read. I was reading these stories and I kept praying that God would help me to understand their stories and to feel what they felt. And there's so much anger and so much brokenness. There's no way to look at them and see. You know, they lived a long life, but the whole thing was so bitter. There was so much pain and I mean, for Helen, her innocence was taken away when she was only a baby, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, she was so young, yeah. and that happened with so many of the women, and they weren't given a chance to decide for themselves. Like, mm -hmm. her father just took her uh -huh. and passed her off to this man, yeah. and yeah. it, it and just hurts. And he was doing the same thing himself, though, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so we can understand that. Mm -hmm. That once there's a, a certain barrier has been crossed, mm -hmm. then they can proceed into lower mm -hmm. uh, levels of morality. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. We have an off-the-air question. How many wives did Joseph have when he married these girls? Mm -hmm. um, he married them in 1843. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so he would have had, he had a total of 33 wives besides Emma, so he was up there in the late 20s and early 30 wives by the time mm -hmm. that he was marrying these girls. And uh, another off the air question, did Joseph consummate these marriages with these girls? Did either of them have children by him? Um, he did consummate most of his marriages. Uh, we have uh, no record of children by these two women, um, but there, although there was no ro romance involved, uh, at least from the woman's viewpoint, and certainly not through Joseph Smith as we read the historical record, uh, but yes, he did consummate these marriages. Uh, in fact, um, Helen Mar Kimball in, in the record um, it said that if she had known that her marriage would have been more than ceremony, she never would have done it. Mm -hmm. And that, that obviously is telling us that there was certainly more to the marriage than just the ceremony. Okay, um, that's the end of the off the air questions. So we still have some phone lines open. If you want to give us a call, 801 973 TV20. That's 8820. Now, both of you girls are Christians. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, you are both keenly aware that salvation mm -hmm. is by grace through faith. It is not by works of any kind. You mm -hmm. cannot become worthy by any works at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then you observe, and both of you have worked with polygamy communities mm -hmm. in, in some of your uh, mm -hmm. working efforts. And you've, you've been involved with some of these communities. You've seen the poverty. You've read about the sadness and loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, after your experiences and in this study, what would you say to our polygamist women viewers tonight as from, coming from your heart as a Christian? Elizabeth? Um, after reading the stories and, and just seeing firsthand, um, what it's really like. Um, there's no understanding about it, what it's like to have a personal and deep relationship with an almighty God, one who is so unconditional in love. There's no height or death, depth or breadth to his love. And just knowing that he loves you so much that he shed his blood on the cross mm -hmm. for your sin. And that's all you have to do is accept a free gift of that love. Mm -hmm. And when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. And by doing things other than accepting him, it's mm -hmm. crucifying him time and mm -hmm. time again. Mm -hmm. And I just want women to know that there's a love that satisfies, and that's mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't come mm -hmm. through a man. There is no man that holds my eternal destiny. Right, absolutely and, right. And I can't do anything that would ever portray goodness um, mm -hmm. to get myself to a place mm -hmm. where I could spend eternity with God. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that I could even do. So. Somebody made an apt remark, and, and they said that other religions outside of biblical Christianity demand that they sacrifice for God. But in Christianity, God sacrificed mm -hmm. for us, and mm -hmm. that's all we need. 
Would you mm -hmm. share your Christian thoughts to, to any of the polygamist women out there? I think the first thing I would say is that you're loved. And it's not a conditional love. It's not a love that you can earn. It's not a love that anything about you. It's not because of anything except that He made you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every detail about you. And He knows the good and the bad details, all of them. And He mm -hmm. still loves you, Exactly. Right? <laughs> and He loves you so much that He would have done it. He would have died on that cross, whether it was just you or the whole world. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. So the love of God is is a very awesome thing to, mm -hmm. and we all want you to experience that it doesn't mm -hmm. come through polygamy it comes through jesus christ Amen. another off-the-air question uh doris what would be the explanation for the celestial beings appearing to these girls that is a very good question and i intend to talk about that uh, or intended to talk about that as i uh, in my closing comments um, in the book of first john we are uh, exhorted to test the spirits, to make sure that the spirits are of God. Uh, and there's a reason for that. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. Mm -hmm. That's a command. And the reason we're to test the spirits is because the spirits can give spiritual experiences. And the demons can give uh, a peace to, to someone. They can change the atmosphere in your room. Uh, the demons come to deceive us. Uh, they don't just come to laugh at us and hurt us. They come to deceive. And so these manifestations were not from God. And the reason I can say that, and I can say that with complete confidence, is because everything that Joseph Smith was trying to get these girls to do was not biblical. And God is never going to confirm something himself that is against his word and against his will. So that's how we know that those manifestations were not from God. And that's why we're told to test the spirits. Okay, we have a call from Caroline from Salt Lake City. Hello, Caroline. Yes. You're on the air, Caroline. Oh, yeah. Yes, you're, oh, you have a question. Hello, how are you? Oh, uh, we're doing very good, thank you. Good, you're welcome. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, my father, who recently, he passed away a week ago Sunday, uh, Roman Catholic is, is my religion. However, I agree 1,000% with everything I see on the programming. Um, however, it makes me very angry that the FLDS Church believes in polygamy still. The only reason the one here, and I'm, I don't call them LDS, because I don't believe them to be saints. And I think it's quite arrogant of any of these people to think that they are prophets. Quorum of the twelve, I only know of twelve apostles. How about you? Um, but my question is that, well, it's not really a question, but this, this baptism of the dead and the polygamy is all centermost in the Mormon Church, the not the fundamental, but the baptism, they still seal dead women to men in the temple. And I know that because I was, I've lived here a long time, I know a lot. And what I'm wondering is why doesn't the world know and or why aren't they learning that this church believes that the celestial heaven is when the husband becomes the god of his own planet and that these women, if the men remember to call their names, become the god's wife of that heaven and that the church believes, well, I'm sorry, it's a cult in my opinion. What, However, what is your question, Caroline? That, that God has a wife and... I'm sorry, Jesus Christ never mentioned that. Uh, Caroline, what is your question? My question is for these women. What were they so afraid of when I heard her saying that Joseph Smith kept asking her to marry him and she was afraid, she was upset. It seems like he used sort of a, a terrorist technique. How did they get away with this? 
how does he gain followers? Because well, Carol, <clears throat> Caroline, these spiritual leaders, um, of false prophets, right. they, they have great charisma, and uh, they will use their, their power, their authority, mm -hmm. the, their so-called authority, to, um, to bring people under their power and under their control. Well, that uh, reminds me of the you know, book of Revelation, false prophet is the Antichrist. Well, it's the spirit of the Antichrist. That's, and I that's believe for that sure. the Antichrist formed church and we're living in the midst of it. Am, am I being too harsh? Well, I think that what we need to do, Caroline, is take everything that we learn and compare it and match it up with what the Bible says. If the Bible says something different than what these people are teaching, then we just ignore them. We, we are not to be afraid of them. We're not to pay attention to them. And, of course, it's always a good idea to witness to them of the truth. And uh, I do have other calls coming. I appreciate your, your calling in, Caroline. It's just does my comment make sense? Yes, it certainly does. I think it's a concern that more people should have. Well, I feel like these these poor people need enlightenment. Enlightenment. They just need to read the Bible and ask and God to reveal truth to them. That's all they need to do. And I do. And God bless your good work. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. You're welcome. God bless. Uh, thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay. We have Dave from Salt Lake City. It says he grew up in polygamy. Hello, Dave. Yes? Yes, Dave, you're on the air. Um, yes, I'd just like to say that uh, um, I come from a long line of polygamists. Okay. Uh, for many, many, many years. Do you mind if I ask what group and, or if it is a group? Um, I guess what I'm hearing from you is contradictory to what I've read in a lot of family journals from uh, women who were multiple women married to one man and uh, these journals are family journals have been kept for many many years and um, they were not as distressed as uh, now of course some were but not uh, not all were as distressed as uh, as uh, you're making it uh, out to be uh, on your show um, I'm not LDS <laughs> Um, I haven't been for... Are you still in the polygamy group? Um, I'd rather not answer that. Okay. Dave, what we are doing here is we are taking information from the book In Sacred Loneliness. And the title of that book is very telling. I didn't write the book. Someone else did, and we took this information. And the, the title itself talks about loneliness. If you want to get that book and read it, you can see that we have taken everything completely uh, in its contextual order and applied it to these interviews. I, and, I, and I understand that. And I, I, just, I guess what I want to say is it obviously is, is one person's perspective. Uh, Dave, I, I, was, I don't want to... Uh, Dave, I was uh, raised in a polygamous family. My mother was a second wife. And I, I saw the pain my mother went through. She went through a lot. But you know what? She also kept a daily diary. And if you went into that diary and read it, you would never read the pain I saw her have because they were not willing to write down uh, all of the inner turmoil they were having. They thought they were living God's will and God's way, and they didn't dare really put to words what they, that their feelings were negative about it. Well, I, like I said, I've been at this for a lot of years, and um, I don't see it, and maybe somebody else does, but I haven't seen it. I mean, I, I see it once in a while, but I don't see it. I see people who are very anxiously and joyfully engaged in what they're doing and well they're 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 definitely engaged in what they're doing i i will agree with you there the women and the men who practice in most of the men and women i should say in polygamy groups believe what they're doing and they live their religion and they live at heart i will agree I, with you there but that doesn't mean that they do not suffer when their husband uh, shares a bed with another woman. That is natural, and that happens, and that is painful. Well, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with you because I, I've seen it the other way. So I'm just going to have to respectfully disagree because I don't. I have, like I said, I've seen it your way a little bit, but I'm going to have to respectfully disagree because I, and the key word that I said earlier was they joyfully did what they did. And so I just have to very respectfully well, disagree. Okay. Okay. That's
That's fine. I have another call I need to take, Dave. I appreciate your call. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have an anonymous phone caller from Utah. Boy, that's kind of interesting. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, first of all, wasn't uh, Joseph Smith's testimony about taking on the polygamy, the like starting out with the polygamy? Wasn't that? Um, didn't he say that he received that as uh, as revelation? And also, weren't the people that did agree to do the polygamy during that time when Joseph Smith, you know, announced that out to the LDS community, weren't a lot of the people, I know I have read anyway, that a lot of the people were not, um, did, did not want to do it. Um, Joseph Smith claimed he had a, a revelation from God that he was to reinstate polygamy and that it actually would become what he called the New and Everlasting Covenant, and anyone who did not practice it would be damned. Now that is what Sir, he, he said. I just, I just know it, because I grew up in Utah, and I, I had to take like Utah history. And uh -huh. like I'm, not, I'm not saying from an LDS. Right. I, but um, you, asked if, you, you asked if Smith had received a, 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 a commandment from God to live polygamy. Isn't that what you asked? Correct. Okay, and that's what I was telling you. He did receive it, and it's in Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay, okay so you, but didn't a little while, didn't you say that he didn't receive this revelation? Well, I don't think he really received it from God. He may have received a revelation from something, but it certainly wasn't from God, because God's not going to reveal something that he's already uh, said was against his will. You okay, know, well, in, in, the, in the New Testament, the leadership of the church is to have only one wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 says, Each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. We are told through the Bible that polygamy is not God's will. He has never commanded it. So he's not going to truly give Joseph Smith a revelation to do something that he's already condemned. That, okay. That's my point. My other question is, though, um, about the F LDS uh -huh. religion. Uh -huh. Wasn't that a, a sect that took off um, from his first wife, Emma Smith? No, no. Uh, the FLDS is just one of the many polygamy groups. Emma Smith rejected polygamy wholeheartedly, and uh, when, when Joseph Smith died, Brigham Young brought the Mormons west, and Emma stayed there, and they started their own church, which was the RLDS. And that's the, that is not... Uh, the FLDS. That's totally did. No polygamy was involved in RLDS at all. And it's currently called the Community of Christ. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Line two. We have an anonymous caller from Midvale. Hello. Hi, Doris. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. You're on the air. Hi, Doris. Um, I'm not from Utah, but I'm married to a, a man that was born and raised in the polygamy um, fact, I guess I don't know how to religion. Uh huh. But um, I wanted to call and just say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. Uh huh. So people that get on TV and say that uh, polygamy is something of God, God never con condoned polygamy. He never condoned right. plural marriage. Right. In the Old Testament, it, it happened, but God never condoned it. Mm -hmm. So, um, You're right. anyway, I just wanted to say that um, I had an encounter with my uh, my father-in-law who tried to tell me that um, in order to get to heaven, I was going to be introduced and introduced to these different prophets, and then I would get to Joseph Smith, where he would introduce me to Jesus, and then I would be introduced to God. My goodness. So, um, I just, I was born, you know, in a... You know, as a Christian my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so God says that his word never goes away void. Right. His, his word is forever, and it never, it, it, it always stays the same. Right. So I told him, I said, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he felt like um, 
that he believed the Bible as well as it was translated correctly and kind of just blew me off yeah. on that. And that was the end of the conversation yeah. with him. That's the way so they do. That's true. I just, I just want to say that I love your program. Thank you. I love Jesus. I know that he exists because I've seen what God has done mm -hmm. to my family through him. Okay. Me, my, my husband out of polygamy and bringing him into, you know, the word of God, the truth, mm -hmm. the real truth. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your call. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. Good night. Okay. We're reaching the end of our program. Valerie is on the line, but Valerie, I'm sorry. We can't take your call. We're just a few seconds now to the end. Would you please call back next week or leave a message with the operator and I'll be happy to call you tomorrow. Uh, frequently, I mention on this program, and we've already talked tonight, three requirements that God has laid upon all of us to obey. One of is, and we're supposed to search the scriptures, the Bible, to see if everything that we're being taught is true. The second one is we're supposed to test the prophets to find out if what they're teaching us uh, is truly from, the, from God. If it's true, if he's a false prophet, if he teaches anything outside of the biblical authority, we don't need to pay any attention to him. We can ignore him. And the third one is we're supposed to test the spirits. Now I realize that many of you don't want to hear this and probably won't believe it, but evil spirits can and do give spiritual experiences. They can provide healing. They can cause you to feel great peace and they do miracles, signs, and wonders. If these people uh, would have tested and obeyed God in all of these areas, there would have been much pain and loneliness in their polygamous lives that we took from historical accounts. These pain and misery would have been avoided. Many people have responded to these remarks that they don't need to test Joseph Smith. They know that he's a prophet.